Hi, Dr. Gary Small, one of the world's renowned experts on the subject of the brain and the mind, a fascinating uh, topic. Doctor, you have spent your entire life on the study of the human mind, the human brain. You know a vast amount of, of uh, technical and non-technical information about how the mind works, including a lot of recent developments about our understanding about a brain and a mind function. If a lay person were privileged to know that which you know about the brain and the mind, how would it impact their thinking? What would they do differently in their lives? How would they consider the way the mind and the brain works? Well, they'd change their lives dramatically, or else they'd be very happy that they're doing all the right things. <laughs> so, well, how would... No, but I, I mean, lay people don't think about the brain and the mind very much. Uh, maybe not nearly as much as their ab, abdomen exercises in the gym. They don't think about it. And if they knew what you knew, if they had spent the years that you had spent, how would it affect their thinking? Well, for, first of all, they'd continue doing their abdominal exercises at the gym because probably the best thing you can do for your brain and your mind is to get active physically. You know, if you look at all Not the active intellectually, active physically. Just, just yeah. move. If you had a choice between working out your brain with mental aerobics or running some laps around the, the UCLA uh, track. The UCLA field, I'd say run the laps. Because from what we know of the science to date, physical exercise is very good for your brain. It's, it's very compelling that if you get your heart to pump more oxygen and nutrients to your brain cells, your brain cells are going to talk to each other more effectively. You're actually going to grow branches between those cells. There's a, a chemical called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that is secreted when you start getting on the treadmill, when you get on your elliptical, when you ride your bicycle. And that chemical actually causes these little branches called dendrites to sprout out and reach out to other neurons next door. So therefore, when we look at the trend nationally in America, obesity, right, is a is a vast 20, 30 year trend. So then we can then, I think, safely deduce, based on what you're saying, that if people are less active today than they were 30 years ago, by virtue of modern convenience, this poses potentially a perilous problem for the Long -term, uh, uh, long term implications for the human brain and mind. Is that fair? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's fair, and we also know that obesity is an epidemic, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Yes. If you add up obesity and overweight, over 50% of the world population has these conditions, and they increase our risk for many illnesses that attack brain health, high blood pressure. Uh, diabetes, high cholesterol, and in fact, the, the obesity is, that's the worst is that fat around the middle, that central obesity contains fat cells that are active and cause inflammation throughout the body and the brain. And we think what's going on with diseases like Alzheimer's is that this high inflammatory level in the brain is attacking normal cells and causing them to degenerate. So the topic then of Alzheimer's is omnipresent in medical study today. Yeah. This is a topic of vast interest, vast study, vast concern. Share with us what the latest information tells us. What is, if any, the good news and what is the worrying news? You know, I think the good news is that Genetics is not the whole story about Alzheimer's disease. For the average person, their heredity only accounts for about a third of the risk. That means two-thirds may be under our own control if we think that lifestyle behaviors are contributing. We already talked about physical exercise. Mm -hmm. Mental exercise may help, keeping the mind stimulated. Nutrition is important. Stress management. All these things that are under our control 
deciding whether to smoke or not, controlling our body weight, taking medicine for illnesses like high cholesterol and hypertension may protect our brains. And the earlier we get started, the better. So, an action that many Americans are engaged in, like Lipitor, a lower cholesterol medication, may have implications to the function of a brain. Oh, clearly. I mean, following your physician's advice, assuming you've got a good physician who's clever and can help you, is good for your brain. It's going to protect your brain. It actually will help you live longer and better. It will extend your life expectancy. So combining optimal health care with healthy lifestyle strategies is the good news about brain health and Alzheimer's risk. Now, the, the bad news is, in some ways, it's also part of the good news. The bad news is we're living longer. And age is the greatest single risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. And we don't yet have a cure. We don't have a definitive treatment that will prevent it. So this extended life, people today commonly living into their 80s, 90s, and sometimes longer, this presents a great challenge then for the care, the proper care of the human mind and brain. Is that true? It is true. I mean, if we were only living to age 50, which would be what you'd expect if you were born in 1900, this wouldn't be such a big problem. So we're seeing baby boomers, nearly 80 million of us in this country, who have begun to turn age 65, getting to the age at risk. By age 65 or older, your risk for Alzheimer's and related conditions is about 10%. If you're living to age 85 or older, it can be as high as 40 or 45 percent. As you've studied the human mind and the brain function for a lifetime, has um, that study allowed you to become more humble about the complexities of the human mind? It's given you a vast understanding of it. But has it also created a humility in you to understand the, the complexities and limitations of the human understanding of the brain? You know, I've come to understand the limitations that I have as a human being and as a scientist to really understand what's going on in our brain, what's going on in our mind. That's what got me interested in this area. I thought it's so fascinating how people behave. And I'd like to really try to figure this out. And I figured some of it out, maybe a tiny, tiny bit. Well, you're one of the great experts in the world, so there's you so, figured out a lot. Yeah, there's so much for us to learn, so much for us to know. And do you find then that every year or every, with every passing year, you solve a question or two that may have resisted solution in the past? But with that solution then becomes a myriad of other questions and problems that may not have existed. Yeah, you know, I think you have the to... Rubik's Cube of yeah, some sort. You have to come to terms with the fact that we're not going to solve all these problems, but we can contribute in small ways. And I think that process of learning and understanding of solving puzzles is invigorating and tremendously rewarding. And that's... That's been a, a wonderful part of my uh, professional life. And, and may have, in fact, kept your brain uh, healthy. Well, I think it does. It, it, it keeps it healthy and it, it makes my life fun.